I hope you have all found the, the files, the repository that we shared with you, the link I put on Brightspace, right? And the lecture of today is uh, a bit involved mathematically, so um, please feel free to stop me to ask questions and make it as interactive as possible. It may take a bit longer than, than the announced time, but I think it's better that you ask questions and uh, understand it than to let go. Because uh, immediately after this lecture, we're going to have a workshop exactly practicing what we are talking about here. <clears throat> Everything that you see in these slides has been already implemented in Python and it's available in this repository. And I can just show you what it is and it has been reorganized and everything including these same lecture notes are in this repository. It's a fully open source repository for dynamic relaxation, both for relaxing meshes, including making these so-called minimal surfaces and also dynamic relaxation for making catenary uh, structures such as the ones that you have to make in this course, earthy. <clears throat> Dynamic relaxation and force directed graph drawing are examples of what is uh, more generally known as the so called gradient descent optimization. So you are using some um, forces or gradients that show the direction of improvement or relaxation or minimization of some form of energy in a system. And the idea is a very powerful idea that is uh, utilized in um, more or less everywhere in the, in the so-called shape optimization business. And um, even beyond the, the applications that I'm going to introduce today, namely the, the making of catenary structures, making minimal surfaces and dynamic relaxation of graphs for graph drawing, you can find the applications of this kind of an approach in many more examples of optimization problems, where you can probably not see the, the, the end solution, the optimal solution, but you can kind of see what are the forces that can push or nudge your solution towards a better state. And you can utilize those forces or gradients to, to nudge it step-by-step step towards a better state. So you remember that I kind of started this lecture series by um, reminding you that the kind of geometry that we will be dealing with is not um, only Euclidean geometry. So Euclidean geometry is relatively simple. Uh, all kinds of walls and things that you make with straight lines are, can be studied with uh, Euclidean geometry. And back then we didn't uh, dig so much into these other two types of geometries and how they can be built. I will show you some slides and pictures, uh, historical ones, that show that uh, geometers or, or those mathematicians who are studying geometry uh, got fascinated with at least these kind of structures, hyperbolic um, geometries and uh, hyperbolic structures. And then they started uh, approaching uh, the making of these kind of geometries by means of geometric methods. And Geometric methods have also existed for making these kind of elliptic geometries. However, the, the approach that we are following today and in our workshop is fully computational as compared to these approaches, because I show you that in, in, the, in its uh, utmost generality, uh, when you have a, a geometry in this format, if you apply forces and let it relax, it can either go towards elliptic geometry or hyperbolic geometry depending on the type of forces. And this is exactly why it is relevant to, to your course and uh, our course, Earthy, because we are, in this case, at least interested in making these kind of geometries uh, by means of shape, op shape optimization. In the next step of um, your series of activities, you are requested to make tessellations in your geometry, and then the immediate step afterwards is to relax them to get these kind of shapes. And that's why we are talking today about dynamic relaxation. So long story short, you can relax geometries to get these kind of hyperbolic or elliptic shapes. <clears throat> 
And this is the same thing uh, that's happening here in the poster of our course. This is uh, from our paper with uh, Hans and Sherwin and Karen. And also the same thing that's happening to um, graph drawing problems in 3D, especially if you want to draw them as bubbles. Uh, there's another piece of code that I shared with you uh, upon the request of some of you for force draw directed graph drawing in 3D based on the same principle, the same kind of algorithm for dynamic reactions, which is a more advanced version of what we formerly had in our plugin syntax. Okay, so um, what are minimal surfaces? Let, let us start with the, the hyperbolic geometries that are actually somewhat historically um closer to us comp as compared to catenary structures but they also show us the efforts that geometers have gone through to to um, create such shapes so whenever you you hear um these words minimize or maximize in fact we are talking about optimization problem so dynamic relaxation if i forget to mention later and the whole idea of gradient descent is actually about optimization and um, this is a general approach to optimization. So minimization of some kind of energy. And in this case, energy is, is not necessarily energy as in um, like uh, thermal energy or mechanical energy. In this case, it's actually um, meant as almost a um, metaphor or an indicator of something that you want to minimize, something that, um, indicates a cost for your solution and you want to minimize that and by minimizing that you have managed to optimize your solution. In fact, the word optimization either means minimization or maximization. So these are the, the so-called geometric approaches that I mentioned for making um, minimal surfaces. In fact, mathematicians using um, complex numbers mainly have managed to make examples of these minimal surfaces that have such properties, the, namely the uh, minimization of the total area subject to some constraints, namely having some boundaries. So the idea is basically um, the same as creating soap bubbles. If you are really crafty with soap bubbles and you can make a soap bubble of um, in between exactly these border wire frames, Imagine you have these circles as wireframes, borders, or here, maybe it's easier to look at this one. And you are crafty enough to, to make a soap bubble in between them. This is going to be the shape that the soap bubble will take because it cannot bear any compression and it will have, have to relax itself into uh, bearing only tension uh, stresses and taking a minimal shape in the sense of minimizing its um, surface area in between these wireframes. And this is what, uh, for instance, in architecture fascinated uh, Fry Otto in, in the design of, um, this is by the way about how you can play with soap bubbles and how they can create these kind of minimal surfaces. Fry Otto actually went through these kind of simulations exactly with soap bubbles and took photographs from them in order to study the shapes possible for this uh, um, Olympic Stadium in Munich. So, but today we can afford to do better. We don't have to simulate these kind of shapes uh, by physical means. We can simulate them computationally and get the shapes directly instead of studying the photographs taken from soap bubbles. This is what we are busy with right now. Th these are the kind of photographs that he made out of soap bubbles and their shapes in between wireframes. And interpolations have also been used for this purpose. Uh, <clears throat> uh, these are, I would still call them geometric approaches for making such surfaces. And uh, here we are going to talk about a physical simulation that will replicate such shapes. And before going to that uh, simulation, I, I need to remind you of some key concepts about the Newton's laws of motion. Um, Sir Isaac Newton. I hope you all know Newton and know that the, the kind of mechanics that we are uh, using in most normal um, or ordinary engineering applications is all Newtonian mechanics, even though there are um, newer uh, 
versions of uh, mechanics uh, dealing with very small scales and very large scales such as quantum mechanics and, and uh, those based on relativity. But th these are the, 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 the kind of things that you need to know, the principles you need to know for uh, working with Newtonian mechanics in most ordinary engineering applications. So there's a concept of um, inertness, which is uh, proportional to the mass of an object. So if you have an object, remember we are going to physically simulate how the nodes of a system, such as a mesh, which can replicate a, a soap bubble, for instance, move um, in relation to forces exerted on them, such as the force of gravity or no force of gravity, but the force of their neighboring elements in a mesh. Remember, a mesh is actually a generalization of a graph, but you can also think about it as a um, fishnet for the time being. So the nodes of this mesh can be imagined to have inertness and they will go through some motion and uh, while they're going through this motion, they're going to accelerate and decelerate and they're going to have velocity, which is speed with a magnitude. And these are the, the, the basic principles, the governing laws of these kind of motions, the Newtonian mechanics principle. So what is inertness? The inertness is, um, to, to understand inertness, you have to um, remember that movement does not require force. This is something that probably Galileo discovered almost at the beginning of the Renaissance. Uh, so you don't need forces to, to cause motion. So if an object is already moving, such as a, a satellite around the planet Earth, you don't need a force to keep it moving. When you actually need a force, it's only when you need to change the velocity of an object. Either the, the um, well, what I meant by the satellite is that there is actually a force that changes its velocity, doesn't change its speed, but changes the, the direction of the velocity, and that's the gravity force of the planet around which a satellite is moving, rotating, right? But the satellite itself doesn't need to have a force um, um, spinning it around that planet, right? Or if you can imagine that you have a, a completely friction-free surface and there's an object moving on that surface for whatever reason, you don't need to apply a force to keep it moving. It will tend to keep moving in the same speed, in the same velocity actually, which means speed and direction of movement um, without any external forces. But if you want to stop it, that means you have to reduce its velocity from whatever it is to zero. That means you have to kind of break. And if you have driven a car, you know that when you want to break the car, you have to exert some force to the, to the brake pedal. And that eventually will exert some force to the, to the wheels and will stop the car. So deceleration and acceleration both require force, right? So if, Similarly, if you want to accelerate your car, it's standing somewhere and you want to accelerate, you have to exert some force to the wheels and to the whole car. And so acceleration is basically the, 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 um, the difference in um, velocity vectors, which is caused by the vector sum of forces exerted upon an object, right? Everyone is comfortable with that. So Newton actually said that the acceleration that an object will take is proportional inversely to the mass of the object. So the more inert the object, the, the massier the object and the less the acceleration given a certain amount of force. So if you exert a force of um, say 10 Newton, which is um, um, roughly equal to the force uh, that is caused by the weight of an object of about one kilogram of mass to an object because the, the, the acceleration, gravity acceleration is about 9.8 multiplied by one kilogram gives us a force of about uh, 10 newtons. If you F equals M times acceleration, the mass of the object times acceleration or if you want to read it like what is written here, you can say F, which can be the total, the sigma of all forces exerted over your object, 
Remember, this is a vector. This is uh, the mass of the object is only a scalar. And therefore, this is also going to be a vector acceleration. Another way to see why this is a vector is that it is actually indicating the difference between velocities over time. So acceleration is also the differential of velocity over differential of time, which is actually the limit of delta velocities over delta time when delta time approaches zero. Again, velocities are vectors, therefore, divided by a scalar, it remains a vector here. Yes? Okay, so the reason we bother to say velocity instead of speed is that it's not just a fancy word, but it's actually indicating that velocity is a vector as opposed to speed, which is only indicating the magnitude of velocity. So when you look at the dashboard of your car and you see the speed like 100 kilometers per hour, you're actually only looking at speed, not velocity. Velocity must be a vector in a three-dimensional space. And the third one, the so-called third law of motion by Newton actually says that action and reaction are uh, inversely equal to each other. And the, when a body exerts a force, on a second body, the second body simultaneously exerts a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the first body. What does that mean? So if you start pushing against a wall or some heavy object, uh, if you push really hard, then your fingers will hurt, right? So the wall pushes back. That, that's the kind of reaction that we're talking about. And uh, you will see that there's a, 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 an important one here in our business that uh, is basically the, the, the reaction of the ground to the, to the structure up, up on top of it. And that's actually the thing that keeps the structure on top of the ground. That's the reason you need a foundation under your structure. If there is no structure capable underneath your structure capable of exerting uh, the same amount of reaction force, then your structure gradually, gradually collapses or, or somehow goes into the ground very, very slowly, but that can happen. And there's a, an underlying principle that usually is not mentioned as one of the laws of Newton, but it's kind of like uh, in the spirit of the laws of Newton, that is that the forces add up like vectors and the superposition of vectors happens by means of vector addition. Are you still with me? Yes. Here's that, uh, I, I used to call it the mysterious force. So if you remember from high school physics, they would show us these kind of diagrams and they would tell us that uh, the object is on top of this slope and it's not going into the slope because there's a reaction force, right? The difference between what we are going to do today and that those kind of diagrams, these are called free body diagrams, by the way. Um, is that in those study of in the study of those kind of diagrams and simple Newtonian mechanics, we used to reduce objects to a single node, right? So we used to think that the whole uh, mass of the body can be represented as a lump lump sum mass on a node at the center of that body of mass, right? That's the principle behind the so-called free body diagrams. So. We used to ignore the other dimensions of these objects and considering the facts that this object itself can bend and so on, right? Unfortunately, we don't afford to, to do that kind of simplification anymore because in fact, whatever we're studying here is actually the deformation of a, uh, an entire structure. It's not just about a single node. It's actually about a, a collection of nodes connected together in some way or even more generally, a collection of elements, as in finite element analysis, connected to each other by means of members that, are, that have some form of elasticity. Or in other words, in terms of graph theory, some links that keep the whole thing together. Or in terms of topology, some connections that keep the whole thing together, right? So, so if this uh, reaction force didn't exist, meaning if this was made up of some form of uh, jelly, 
which was really soft and the, the reaction force would not be sufficient and this was like a, a kilogram of mass this would accelerate even though slowly and go into the slope but if your slope is made up of something relatively firm and stiff then it does not go into the slope but actually goes um, along the slope down and yeah so you, you have probably i mean hopefully seen these kind of studies on free body diagrams studying the acceleration of an object on this slope if not you can just look them up on wikipedia and these famous examples what will be the the acceleration of the object along the slope so the force that is exerted upon the object is actually the force of gravity which is equal to the mass of the object times g which is the gravity acceleration so it's actually a, a manifestation of the Newton law of motion. In this case, it's kind of the other way around. So you perceive actually the gravity as the cause of this force rather than the other way around. That is because this object is situated in the field of gravity of the planet Earth, and this field of gravity exerts an acceleration force to the object. And therefore, you have a force that you call weight, right? But what is the amount of force that is parallel to this surface? You find it using simple trigonometry, which is basically the shadow of this force along this axis. If this is the angle theta, then doing this kind of analysis, if this was an, an axis perpendicular to this surface and this is gravity, you can look this up and you, will, um, you can do simple trigonometry and find out that this amount of force, which is like the shadow of the gravity force will be equal to mg cosine of half of pi minus theta, yeah? Or mg sine of theta. Because this angle will be equal to theta and this one will be uh, half of pi minus theta or something like that. And then you will get to sine of theta or cosine of half of five minus theta. Anyway, this was just a reminder. Okay, I want you to feel comfortable with these things before we go further. Okay, now we get to the Hooke's law. Remember from the lecture about finite element uh, analysis. Uh, in principle, this is, this is not true for two dimensional surfaces or even for soap bubbles, but this is a simplification that at least we afford to, to make for being able to solve uh, this problem of uh, finding um, minimal surfaces using a computational simulation, we can assume that the only forces that keep the whole thing together are the forces uh, along the, the, the imaginary springs in the object. And these imaginary springs are actually um, making the object something that can be virtually considered as a fishnet rather than a mesh. That's what I meant by fishnet. Um, but how do these springs act? This is very important to note that springs um, can only exert reactive forces. What do I mean? So if you have a spring which is relaxed and it's on the table, no one is touching, no one is squeezing, no one is stretching it, you don't expect the spring to start jumping around and pushing things and pulling things, right? it will only start exerting a force if you try to squeeze it. So if you make it shorter than, it, than what it needs to be, or if you try to stretch it, then it will react to that force and it will try to pull back to its uh, contract to its original length and the other way around. And this amount of force, it's called the Hooke's law, but it's actually only a, an empirical study by, by um, a physicist who, name of Hooke who actually figured out that this amount of force um, within small ranges actually corresponds almost linearly or for, for our purposes linearly to the to the amount of contraction or, or expansion in the spring which is noted by delta x which is the difference from the relaxed length of the spring okay times uh, a coefficient that is uh, typically denoted by k which indicates the stiffness of the spring in question. So the stiffer the spring, the higher this value k, which means for the same amount of force, 
if the string is really stiff, then this k is a large value. That means it will have a very small contraction or expansion with respect to that amount of force, right? Um, a question to you. Do you think this is a vector equation? Delta X. Delta X is a vector? Yeah. And so it is. <laughs> and so, <laughs> conclusion? Y you actually got it um, very sharply. So everyone knows, I mean, so far, I, I hope that you all remember that force must be a vector, right? But it's even more important to denote that X positions are also vectors, right? These are position vectors. These are vectors of dimension three by one, X, Y, Z. So you subtract two of these vectors to make delta X as a vector. So therefore delta X is also kind of a vector. And this is also a vector, yeah? This is going to be one of the most important details in this talk, so you will see later. For now, just remember that this is a vector. Okay, remember I said that to every action, there's a reaction with the same amount and in the opposite direction by the other body to which you are exerting force. So um, this uh, tough guy is now exerting a force, the force almost like 80% of his force of weight up on the ground and actually through only one finger. So you can imagine that the, the reaction going from the ground, which is actually opposing to this, uh, to this force and reacting to this force has to go through his finger. So there's a lot of stress on his index finger here. This is just a reminder of that. And <clears throat> what I said by, um, what I meant by saying that um, the Hooke's law is only valid in small ranges is that if you exert a, an unreasonably uh, large amount of force to an to an ordinary spring, you don't expect it to act linearly anymore. It can easily go into the plastic mode or just, uh, you, you may just damage the spring and then in that range, it won't be linear. So in small ranges where the spring is um, acting linearly, you can assume that it's governed by the so-called Hooke's law. But in, in, in structural mechanics, you typically don't talk about F equals K delta X. Instead, you talk about sigma, equals E epsilon. And epsilon is like an indicator of um, relative delta X divided by the, the entire length of the object. And this is called the strain. And this one is uh, an indicator of pressure, actually the kind of pressure that you can, uh, that this um, uh, sportsman can feel on his finger, uh, which is proportionate to the inversely proportional to the area to which the force is being applied, right? So the fact that actually makes this a tough job is that instead of putting his palm on the ground, he is actually putting his entire force of weight on one finger, right? So that whole amount of force is divided by a much smaller area as compared to the area of his palm. It, had he put his right, uh, right hand palm on the ground, then this area would have been much bigger and the stress would have been much smaller, right? So again, another reminder that these uh, equations are actually meant to convey an intuition. So what exactly we mean in plain uh, English by uh, stress is actually implied with this equation as well, okay? Okay, so now you're prepared for the main part. Now we're going directly into the first or the most archetypical example of dynamic relaxation. And in fact, the most famous and the most representative or an archetypical example of a dynamical system even. This is um, <clears throat> a very, very important concept in 
the study of dynamic systems, control engineering, and uh, structural mechanics, especially when you're talking about <clears throat> the dynamic response of a structure. <coughs> Sorry, to forces like um, um, an earthquake. And by dynamics, we mean um, a kind of a non-trivial uh, way of uh, moving for all the nodes in the system, namely that the system will go into some kind of an oscillation when you apply a force like this. What, what do we mean by a system? As I said, this is an archetypical example of a dynamical system composed of a body of mass, a spring with a stiffness, and something else that might sound weird to you right now, this is called a damper. But that's exactly the kind of thing that you have in the, the, the suspension system of cars. If you didn't have such dampers, then after every bump on the road, your car would uh, oscillate, go up and down for like an hour, right? But there is always some kind of damping there to dampen this, uh, this kind of oscillatory motions immediately or gradually so that you don't feel like going up and down, up and down, up and down, right? But how does this work? A damper is something exactly like um, um, a honey spoon in a honey jar. How so? Um, the damping force is some kind of a friction force that is proportional directly to the amount of velocity. So the faster you try to pull the honey spoon up and down into the honey jar, the, 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 the harsher it will react to that amount of force and the, the, the greater will be the force of friction. So it's proportional to the, to the velocity. And that's what you see exactly in this equation. So C is the damping coefficient, which is like uh, related to how viscose is the, the liquid in the jar. Honey is uh, a good example of a viscose uh, liquid. We say that it has viscosity, which means exactly this, that it has a high coefficient, a high damping coefficient. And <clears throat> the, the more viscose the, the liquid, the higher the damping coefficient. So this is basically a constant indicating how um, high will be the damping force of reaction or force of friction. And that is proportional to the velocity of the moving object, right? And velocity is basically the derivative or the gradient of um, displacement. Displacement here is denoted by x um, or position actually, position. And when you have delta within positions, this dx over dt is actually a, uh, the limit of I got my pen working. So reminder, quick reminder from high school calculus. Then you have delta x over delta t, and you have, you're talking about the limit of this fraction. When delta t goes to zero, you actually denote it with differential of x over differential of t, and you actually call it the derivative. The derivative of what? The derivative of x, which is the position vector as a function of time t. Yeah? So if your reminder, if your position vectors are actually all shown along a curve, which is like the trajectory of movement, what will be this velocity at a point on your curve? You have to remember this. Basically, you need to connect a couple of dots to remember this. Anybody? The tangent. Exactly. Who was that? Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> so x1 and x2, or rather x and x plus delta x, two moments along this trajectory, two positions, delta, this one minus this one will give you delta x, which is going to be a vector over delta t. When this delta t approaches zero, then you actually get a vector, another vector, a small vector here that is tangent to the curve. That will be the velocity vector, okay? 
So I hope now you feel comfortable with these signs, dx over dt. And this is also a shorthand version, especially used when we are talking about derivatives with respect to time. You show them with u dot, u double dot, and so on. So if this is u dot and indicating velocity, what is this one? Anybody? Acceleration. Maybe. Yes, because it's again the derivative of velocity, which is indicating um, the, the rate of growth of velocity with respect to time. So whenever we are talking about uh, derivatives, we are actually talking about, let me go back to this example. Imagine instead of position a long time, you have time and then you have some kind of price, like price of oil over time. Yeah. So if you want to predict what will be the price of oil after this moment, having had this moment and the previous moment, if you were to make a prediction, what would you do? How does this relate to whatever else I'm talking about here? And I'm not talking about using a crystal ball. Huh? So imagine this is the moment in time we are here. So you have had all this data so far for the price of oil. So you have the curve here and you want to make a prediction about how will it go in the next minute because it usually changes every minute when a, po a politician talks about something, right? But for the next minute, maybe we can, we can afford to make a prediction. How would you do that? Would it be helpful to have a tangent? So if it's moving along this direction, then maybe if we were to make only one prediction, I would, I would make it along this tangent for the next moment, right? The tangent is again, a, 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 some kind of a velocity or some kind of a derivative actually. In this case, it's not, we're not talking about a vector. We are only talking about the rate of change. So price of oil at time T plus delta T minus the price of oil at time T divided by delta T, that is actually giving us an indication of the rate of change of what we care about, which is the price of oil over the change of, so this is called the dependent variable. And this one is called the independent variable. Independent of, independent of whatever is happening in the world, time is moving forward, right? So this is definitely an independent variable. Space is also typically another kind of independent variable. This is something that appears to be dependent over on time. And this is the rate of change of something dependent on something independent, independent. And that is what we call <clears throat> a derivative, right? And when we are talking about this at the limits of delta t approaching zero, then we call this differential of p as a function of time over differential of t. Or you can call it p dot. Yes? which is also like the slope. If I put h here, this is actually giving you an indication of how steep is the road when you are walking over a mountainous range. How much uh, height do I hike? Do I need to hike for every step I take in the direction of x? Imagine this is x, the direction of your movement forward, and this is the height. This is the height of the next step, this minus the height of this step. That gives you an indication of how steep the whole road is. Yeah. This is probably the quickest reminder possible about calculus and derivatives. Okay, so now let us study this system in particular. So what is happening to the system? Imagine you have this system consisted of this body of mass over a super slippery ice cube hung with a spring to the wall and also with a damper to the wall. So the only two things that will oppose the movement in any direction will be the damper and the spring. Both of them will somehow react or resist to the motion of this body of mass, right? So this one will react um, proportionally to uh, its deviation from its relaxed length. So that will be K delta X right, or k times uh, 
x if we start counting x from zero that will be simply equal to kx right this one will start opposing the motion by exerting a force proportionate to the viscous, uh, uh, viscosity of the, the liquid in the damper. That will be C times the, the velocity differential of or the derivative of uh, X, the position with respect to time. And this one, if it has to move, uh, with this exerted force, the, the exerted forces have to somehow cancel each other out. And there should be, if it, well, actually, if I, uh, I should have said, if it has to take any acceleration, the resulting forces should be non zero, meaning that, again, if nobody is touching this object, everything has its relaxed length and the, the, the spoon in the honey jar is not moving. So you don't expect this thing to start moving, right? But if you exert an external force, you change the equilibrium and you cause a reason for this object to gain some acceleration meaning if the external force is bigger than the, the reactive force of the spring and the opposing force of, of uh, viscosity the damping force then the object can be expected to take an acceleration proportional inversely proportional to its mass exactly equal to m times the second derivative of position which is m times acceleration this is basically a way of rewriting this equation in another notation right so you just need to get comfortable with the fact that notations across different books and different papers are different from each other and because i'm i'm, I'm referring to a certain paper here i didn't change the notation so for my taste i would indicate all vectors with bold letters and so on but i didn't change the notation much to to keep it similar to that Right? So you just need to remember that we are talking about vectors here, here, and here. Everything is a vector in this equation with, uh, with the exception of these coefficients. M is a coefficient of mass, C is a coefficient of um, damping, and K is a coefficient of stiffness. Right? Okay, so now we figured out how much acceleration this object will take if uh, exposed to an exerted force, an external exerted force. And we can actually indicate the, the total sum of these external force minus the, the force of um, reaction of the spring and the force of reaction of the damper as the resultant force. And that resultant force should be the, the cause of the acceleration of the object. There is no other reason for this object to accelerate. So once you have these forces, um, you have the so-called equation of motion, the dynamic equation of motion. That is what we are talking about here. And if the, the external force disappears, then you have this kind of an equation. The external force equals zero, then the object has already started moving, right? So just because it has already started moving, this is very, very important. Because it has started moving, this object with its inertness, it keeps moving, right? So it starts swinging around and fluctuating and oscillating in its motion, right? And then the system has to balance itself somehow, right? So the next question is, how will it move over time? That's a very fundamental question in, in the study of dynamical systems. How will it continue to move after the external force has disappeared? So it has gained momentum. That's the other way of saying that it has inertness. There is mass in the system. It has started moving and now it has to stop. So it's kind of like uh, someone uh, swinging somewhere and then they continue to swing and, and oscillate and how, when, the, when will that stop? So if there is no damping in the system, you can expect the system to start uh, oscillate, to, to continue oscillating back and forth, going here, going to the left, going to the right, going to the left, going to the right, to the right and so on and so forth. And nothing will stop, right? Because remember there is, if there's no other force opposing this, then uh, the spring will push it back then it will pull it back, it will push it back, and so on and so forth, right? So the thing that dampens this, this movement and, and, and makes the system eventually 
get to the equilibrium or get back the system get back to the relaxed position of the spring is the damping coefficient okay that's a big picture so the question is how or when will it stop right so sometimes people ask me these ironic questions why do you bother with these things because every no, everybody knows that it will somehow stop right I mean, you can guess that it will stop and you can guess that there will be some kind of emotion if you start plotting the, the, the position of the object with respect to time. Imagine you have attached a, a pen to the object and you are rolling a paper underneath the object. That is the kind of diagram that you get after recording the, the motions of the, of the pen. So you have made some kind of a plotter for yourself, right? Imagine a roll of paper rolling underneath this object and there's a pen attached to this one. That's the kind of thing it will draw, right? So everybody knows how it, that it will be some kind of a diagram like this. Why we bother with these kind of things? Because we're talking about exact sciences. We're not talking about Zen and, and philosophy. We're talking about exact sciences. We want to know exactly how, will it, how it will accelerate, how it will decelerate, how it will stabilize. We want to find out exactly how much mass or how much damping coefficient, how much um, stiffness is necessary to keep our structure safe, for instance, right? And one more important thing, you want to know what is this frequency of movement, which is called the natural frequency of, of vibration in our system. If we don't know that, if you're not into exact sciences and we only design with intuition, we can cause probably a disaster. There was a, there was a bridge in the United States that uh, once collapsed because there were uh, a brigade of soldiers marching on the, on the bridge exactly with the same uh, vibration frequency as the natural frequency of the bridge. That can excite a system so much that it can collapse the system, right? These kind of things can happen. So again, remember this is exact sciences and there is no such thing without, uh, as exact sciences without mathematics. Mathematics is the language of exact sciences. There is no shortcut in that, right? So these are the, the, the necessary concepts for understanding how such systems work. And in this case, we're not talking about the earthquake resistance of your building, but this is also necessary for that. But we're actually talking about understanding these kind of systems in order to exploit them and utilize them for simulating um, a mesh that is relaxing itself um, when exposed to external forces such as gravity. Okay, because we want to simulate it instead of making soap bubbles and taking pictures from soap bubbles. We want to find the final optimal relaxed shape. This is a matter of shape optimization. So what will happen here? This is the toughest part and maybe I can give you a short break and I will keep the slide on. And you can think about what's happening here. You can also read and then I will get back to you to continue this. Okay, so back to this business. Uh, have you studied the slides? More or less? Okay. So let me explain what is happening here and you will have more time to read this at home. And actually I, I wouldn't expect you to understand every single detail here because this is really something even uh, complex for many engineers even. Um, those who even studied hardcore engineering, like co uh, control engineering, this, this is a very, very subtle thing uh, with a very difficult mathematic, mathematical meaning and in gaining an intuition about this actually takes time. But what I want you to see here is the fact that we are solving what we call a differential equation. Here we have an equation uh, which has terms that involve the some variable, some function, a dependent variable, which is a function of a, an independent variable time. It's derivative and it's second derivative, right? So we are solving this as a differential equation. So it's an equation that involves derivatives or differentials of some variable, a function of another variable. And so what we are trying to find out, which is predicting the shape of this diagram, 
is how will this system react over time or how, how will it act or behave over time having been excited with an external force and then um, um, let free to to move and continue its movement because of the inertness or the momentum it has gained it will continue to move and we want to exactly find out how it will move or continue to move and when will it stop and what will be the exact dynamics those are the questions right so all of those questions can be answered if we manage to find the exact shape of this as a function of time right we know that this is a function of time. The question is, what is the shape of this as a function of time? Okay. Do, do you understand the question? I'm not talking about the answer. The question is, what kind of a function is this? Right? So we want to know, for instance, what could be the function whose, let me see. What could be a function which would fulfill this equation? It's, I'm just rewriting this one. What does it mean for a function to fulfill this equation? So this is just a coefficient, remember? This is a coefficient, a scalar coefficient. This is also a scalar coefficient. So somehow this function has to, or a combination of this function and its first derivative somehow have to cancel out its second derivative or some other combination like that. Somehow they have to cancel each other out so that this ends up being zero, right? Because these are all non-zero coefficients, right? There are multiple, multiple ways of thinking about solving these kind of equations. This is what we learned in control engineering, which is using what we call an unstyle or an educated guess. Sorry, an unsatz. That's a German term, I think. Or an educated guess. So what would be an educated guess here? So if this function has to somehow cancel out its, uh, its own derivatives and second derivatives and so on, right? The first thing to observe is that this function should be such that its derivatives are somehow proportional to itself, right? And if you have studied mathematics long enough, then you know that the only functions that have such properties are basically into three categories or maybe even two categories. If you take, for instance, sine of t as a function of time. So imagine f of t is sine of t. What is the derivative of sine of t? If you remember from calculus, high school calculus, that is cosine of t. And if you have cosine of t, the, uh, so the, and cosine of t can be said to be somehow uh, just a shifted version of sine of t because cosine of t minus half of pi will be the same as sine of t or something along those lines, right? So, and the second derivative, observe this one. So the second derivative of this one, now if we take the second derivative of time uh, with respect to time of cosine of t, uh, will be negative sine of t, right? So somehow the second derivative is inversely proportional to, not inversely proportional, it's just equal to this one with a neg negative sign. So it will cancel out the first derivative, right? So then I would say there's no wonder that actually we have this situation here. Here, doesn't it look like a cosine of t or sine of t function, right? So my mathematical intuition tells me that there should be something related to sines and cosines in this equation or another family of functions. 
which is even more general, which includes sines and cosines. Those are the so-called exponential functions discovered and studied mostly thanks to Leonard Euler. Therefore, in his honor, this so-called number, which is actually a function, is called the Euler number. So said to be equal to 2.7178 something something. But this is not like we are raising a number to a power. This is more like we are talking about a function, which is basically in computation denoted with exponential of x which is equal to a, a sum that can be truncated or, or stopped when we, we have limited precision. So for i1 over x, <clears throat> I have to look it up, but uh, this is the so-called expansion of the uh, exponential function. This is how it's computed. We're not taking such a strange number to any power. We are actually computing this series of one uh, x to the power of k over k factorial. Factorial function, you know what it is, right? Factorial of three is equal to, three factorial would be equal to one multiplied by two multiplied by three. So these are just some coefficients and we are actually only raising x, which is the, the argument, the input argument of the function to a power k. And we can truncate this series into like 100 elements or even 50 elements, that would be enough to get a good approximation. This is the function. And so this is a function we're using here. So another interesting thing about this function, uh, other than its relation to the sines and cosines based on this so-called Euler equation, this is the most generalized form of the Euler equation, which you have probably seen as something like that. This can be derived from this equation. You can look it up and you can give it a try. Just by putting the right angles inside this equation, you will get this one. So this is even a more generalized version. Anyhow, so back to the question. So if you can just accept it for a fact from me that if you have a function of time, e to the power of lambda t, its derivative will be, with respect to time, it will be lambda e to the power of lambda t. So if you can call this f of t, which is perfectly normal because this is the definition that we started with and following basic calculus, you can figure out actually based on the expansion of that series and taking the derivatives, you can find out that this is true. This is a fact that you can check. You can even check it on, on a paper in half an hour, you can find out the answer is this one. You can take the derivatives by calculating the limit and you will find out that the derivative of it such an exponential function will be proportional to the coefficient of the, the independent variable here. That means this coefficient will appear here in the first derivative. If you take the derivative once again, you will see that the second derivative of f of t with respect to time will be lambda times lambda e to the power of lambda t or f of t, which means lambda squared f of t, which is exactly what's happening here. So remember I said we are going to take an educated guess as to what could this function be, right? And our mathematical intuition tells us that the only functions that are somehow proportional to their own derivatives are exponential functions, um, hyperbolic trigonometric functions are also in this category, which are again, constructed from exponential functions and sinusoidal functions or trigonometric functions. So this would be a very nice educated guess because it can, it can tell us, okay, suppose, suppose the equation has an answer in this form, has a solution in this form. If we put this into the equation, then we will see that this, the, the whole equation will become somewhat simpler. We can factorize all these terms 
they're all the same. Now we have another equation here, which can be written as lambda m lambda squared plus c lambda plus k. And we can just factorize e to the power of lambda t from the whole equation and say, this has to be equal to zero. Okay, just some basic facts about this function. So this is say is equal to some form of exponential of time with some coefficient here. So this is a positive value. Time has never been negative. Lambda is a positive uh, coefficient and you don't expect this function to be zero unless uh, well, it, it just grows if lambda is positive and it, it declines if lambda is negative, but it doesn't reach exactly zero, right? So the only way for this equation to be equal to zero, there is no trivial way of this thing being zero immediately. The only way this can be zero is that this part is equal to zero. Then we find ourselves in a very pleasant situation where we have to solve only a quadratic equation here, for which I hope that you have seen a solution like this in high school mathematics. If you have a quadratic equation in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero, we know that if you do the, the some algebraic operations, you can get to the form of the roots of this equation in the form of x being equal to minus b plus minus radical b squared minus 4ac. This is one of the few things that I have memorized in mathematics because it's so versatile and useful, right? But you, you can also do this even by hand and get to this formula again, or you can look it up. Anyway, the important thing here is that we actually simplify a differential equation, which is relatively a tough one because we have a second derivative, a first derivative, and the function itself being equal to zero, we reduced it actually to an algebraic equation involving only solving a quadratic equation, which you have seen in high school, right? So now we can find, based on this equation, we will put, we will replace, th these are just algebraic coefficients, right? So here A is actually equal to M. B in, in that archetypical example is now called C and this coefficient is called k. If I just plug in these values into this equation, I get this one, right? Now it starts getting very, very exciting. Why? Because now we have something, typically we call these kind of things as determinants. Something that determines the fate of the system is here now. How will it determine the fate of the system? Remember what was the main question here? The main question was, what is the form of this equation? What kind of a function could this be? Such that it will cancel out its own derivatives and second derivatives with these coefficients in this equation, right? We are looking for a function which would fit into this differential equation. That immediately means that this function somehow has to cancel out its own derivative and its second derivative because these coefficients are all positive, right? So we, take, we took an educated guess. We assumed that this function, because it has to cancel out its uh, derivative and its second derivative, has to be either a sinusoidal function or more generally an exponential function. Because exponential functions have this um, amazing and scary property that if you have, if you ever hear something like this is uh, something like the coronavirus is growing exponentially, regardless of the coefficients, that means that the rate of growth of the function is somehow proportional to the function itself. You see that with wealth, you see that with population, and you see that unfortunately with contagious diseases, that they usually follow this uh, kind of exponential laws. and. That means that their, their rate of growth, the rate of growth of the function of interest actually is dependent on the function itself. So the rate of growth of this function at this point, meaning the slope of the tangent is somehow proportional to the amount that you have here. So the higher the mass of a population, the, the higher will be the speed of growth of that population. 
but sometimes it's also in this form. It's it's kind of this the situation where that you have with uh, a bottle of wine getting better and better over time because there are some enzymes or bacteria. That's not my cup of tea. My biology is really poor, but anyway, they are acting and changing the wine in the bottle over time. Then it reaches some some kind of an equilibrium state. This is also an exponential function, but uh, something in this form, maybe one minus e to the power of t, or some coefficients here, right? So wherever you have a dependency between the rate of growth with the function itself, you have some kind of a um, yeah maybe I cannot say so generally, but usually you have some kind of an exponential function playing a role over there. Yeah, so that's why we took this educated guess, and then. By making this educated guess, we got into this point. That what is what is so exciting about this point, I hope you see what I see here, that we managed to reduce this differential equation to an algebraic equation, and then we managed to solve it, right? So now what does this mean? This means that there will be two, two responses for this equation. One of them corresponds to lambda equal to minus c plus radical c squared minus 4 mk over 2m and the other one is lambda equal to minus c minus radical c squared minus 4 mk the square root of this over 2m yeah so we will have basically two ways this can work by plugging basically actually in this direction by plugging these lambda values into this one we have managed to find a solution this is something that we can call a solution because this will satisfy this equation right and then we have as i said something that we can call a determinant because it will determine the way the system behaves how so because now we have a kind of a relatively strange situation if the combination of c and m and k is such that what you have under the square root actually ends up being positive you get a positive square root out of this okay that means the system will have a lambda value that is uh, only a yeah minus c plus c squared minus 4 mk and that will be a positive value and therefore i have done the math here so let me see if c yeah that's the case that i'm talking about if c is larger than two times the square root of m times k or in other words c squared minus 4 mk is larger than zero which means that the, what we are taking the square root of is larger than zero that means the system will only have strictly real what we call eigenvalues and the response is steadily convergent to zero. That is the situation that you see here. That the system only declines steadily toward the, the relaxed state. That means the system is what we call an overdamped system. The frictions are such uh, high uh, amounts that they kind of lead the system to directly and smoothly without any oscillation go to the relaxed state, right? But uh, sometimes another situation happens and this is, these are all determined by this one. Um, if this C is equal to zero, because M and K are both positive values, this will definitely be a negative value in the square root you can see that right if if c is zero then you are only left with negative four times m times k and both m and k are positive values therefore this will be definitely a negative number under the square root then we get into a scary situation which will definitely involve something like negative 12. What does this even mean? Well, 
you can say that this is negative four times three, and then you can take four out and say two times negative three. And then, or you can even take this as negative one times three and say, this is the square root of three times two times the square root of negative one. What on earth is the square root of negative one? Anybody? I squared, I. I, so this is something that mathematicians have called an imaginary number because they got into these kind of situations. If you have ever wondered why they created such crazy things, it's not because they were crazy, it's because that they found it useful in such situations because it happens naturally here. And it's just handy because of this uh, ordinary equation, we can use this, the i actually is here as well, as you can see, and here it will help us figure out the oscillatory response of dynamical systems among many other applications but this is mainly the most important application in engineering and this is really like a rabbit hole so i cannot get deeper into this one right now but this is something that is not unprecedented we know what to do with this and we call this a, a complex number when this situation happens then we have a negative value here and we have an imaginary number here. That means in the nominator, we have what we call a complex number. Which is basically in this form, exactly in this form. So some sigma, which is a real value times t plus i for the imaginary number times omega t. Omega for the natural frequency of vibration. And this will be simplified into this form, which is a bit less weird because this is now a real number multiplied by a complex number. Okay. But long story short, these are used to plot these responses. Let me see. these so-called dynamical responses are plotted this way. After you put these values in, then you get in, actually into functions whose plots can be drawn on paper. The real parts or the, the, the real parts can be drawn on paper like this one. And then you can see that um, you, you get exactly to these different kinds of situations. So when you have exact only only an oscillatory response, meaning that C is equal to zero. Basically, there's nothing left here and you have only an imaginary number because this is a negative number and the square root of a negative number. So you have a strictly imaginary uh, number here. So e to the power of an imaginary number that will correspond to only a, a fully oscillatory response for the system. That's a system without damping, remember? Now our mathematics confirms our intuition that if the system has no damping whatsoever, then it will continue to oscillate over time for a long, long time, right? But if we have an in-between situation, now, now I'm going back to the first one, then the system, uh, well, if C to the uh, c squared minus four times m times k is negative but c is not equal to zero then you are left with a, a real number here and an imaginary number here that means you have a complex number that means you have a part that will oscillate and a part that will that will determine the time response and the convergence to the equilibrium state okay so I kind of don't afford to linger more on this concept, but I, I hope I made this clear that the combination of the massing, the mass coefficient, the, the damping coefficient and the sti stiffness coefficient of the spring somehow will determine in the form of changing the path of this from being positive, negative or zero, 
uh, will determine how the system behaves. So when this is exactly equal to zero, we have what we call the natural frequency of vibrations. And that's the frequency at which the system can be excited. That's the frequency at which you can get the effect of resonance. Have you ever seen videos of people singing a note and managing to break a glass of wine? That's what's happening here. So if you manage to exactly sing the note that resonates, can you hear this? With this, and if it's loud enough, then you can manage to break this without even touching it. You can manage to excite this glass. This is not a good glass for that purpose. You need a very thin glass of wine. And you can change the frequency, natural frequency of vibration by the amount of wine in the glass. Yeah? If you manage to sing exactly the note that resonates with the natural frequency of vibration, you can excite the system so much uh, uh, as to break it even. Yeah? That's Unfortunately, what happened to that bridge in the United States. And then you have also another kind of determinant that shows how damped the whole system is, which is used here. But this is the most essential one, omega zero, which is the natural frequency of vibration. Okay. So another story i told you first about soap bubbles and their relation to architecture now it's time for catenary structures and i think that you have probably seen this picture many many times and heard people talking about this this is exactly how we can do this computationally instead of making models with chains uh, such as what gaudi did for designing sagrada familia Instead of hanging chains and taking pictures from chains and, and drawing these, uh, with these chains and so on, you can simulate the whole mesh. As you can see, you, you, you kind of see what I call the fishnet here, right? You have some kind of a fishnet consisted of these chains. And Gaudi was relaxing the system while using the force of gravity and then figuring out what would be the shape of the system such that if you inverted this shape, it would be a catenary structure, right? In this shape, we call it a funicular structure. If you, convert, uh, if you invert the whole structure down, you call it a catenary structure. Catenary arches and catenary domes and so on. All right. So now we are going to use the, the, the equation of motion that I hope you have understood fully so far in simulating this system. Um, just a side note, this is the, this is the uh, equation that, uh, this is the, the algorithm that I had uh, proposed in my PhD for drawing graphs. This is the older version, maybe you find it more intuitive because it's directly talking about attraction forces and repulsion forces. There's a newer version of this one in our repository for dynamic accession, which is based on the algorithm that I'm going to talk about now. So this one does not directly deal with mass and, and, and and uh, damping coefficients, it only deals with stiffness coefficients, right? But uh, the more advanced version is in the repository. I just leave it for your information and remember that the same principles are followed for even drawing graphs over there. Anyhow, so back to our main business, which hasn't even yet started, uh, which was simulating these structures, relaxing them, optimizing their shapes so that they can act as catenary structures, right? So we want to actually follow the path of Gaudi, but using computers instead of chains. So we want to compute the shape such a mesh will take so that without hanging chains, we can get this shape. So imagine that the system, if you remember, I told you at the beginning that we do not afford to work with the free uh, body diagrams anymore because our system uh, is a complex system consisted of many nodes. And so you don't have only a node and you don't have only an, actually even here we had only one node, right? So now imagine that we're going to do similar things on all nodes of the system. So now we are talking about the ith node in the system. So this uh, subscript i actually denotes which node of the mesh we are talking about. So we are imagining that our mesh, this uh, fishnet is consisted of many nodes each of which can be exposed to an, some amount of an exerted external force called P sub I. Uh, 
and in the direction of one of the axes of our coordinate system, in this case, x. You can ignore safely x here because whatever we have done in our own repository is fully vectorized. You don't need to worry about x and y and z separately. We are doing all these things at the same time. So you can just pay attention to the fact that we are talking about the if node here. Yeah? So imagine one of the nodes of this entire fishnet in isolation. Well, it's not exactly in isolation, is it? Because it's kind of hung in the middle of its neighbors. Remember? The neighbors in the mesh and the topology of the mesh are literally the things that keep the mesh together. Or the nuts in between, uh, well, the, the pieces of rope in between the nuts in a fishnet. Right? I'm only talking about the concepts, okay? Don't be scared of the notation here, okay? So if it is somehow um, stuck to some location in the space in between its neighbors, so what is the nature of the forces that keep it in that position, right? If there were no neighbors, if there were no pieces of ropes connecting this knot to another knot in a, a neighboring knot, then it would just, what would happen to that node? You had a body of mass somewhere hanging in the space. There would have been gravity and then it would fall down, right? So the only things that keep it in that location are the neighboring nodes. And then we afford to imagine that there are springs in between this node and its neighbor nodes, right? And then we can assume that these springs or these pieces of ropes, whatever you can think of them, or the edges in your mesh, they have some stiffness values. Right? And those stiffness values are exactly, or those springs are the things that keep it in that position. If you try to move it to another position, those springs will react and they will resist that motion. If those springs are not there, then everything will fall apart. You just have a powder. You just have a bunch of nodes. Right? Remember, I was, that's why I bothered so much telling you about topology, because topology or the links are the only things that keep the system together. Now you can assume a stiffness for every one of those links, right? And then you can also, uh, just because we want to make sure that it will converge to a solution. Imagine that there is no uh, damping coefficient. This can oscillate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and we will get nowhere, right? Because we want this simulation to end, because we want it to converge to a solution, we, want to, we also want to consider that as in reality, there is usually some friction. So we also consider that friction in the form of the energy dissipated in, uh, th that's exactly the kind of friction that dissipates energy within the nodes of such a dynamical system, right? So some friction between the joints of this mesh, after all, it's not exactly a fishnet, is it? It's, it's kind of a mesh, we are assuming that it's a surface and then there is some wrinkling and some friction and some dissipation of energy in the nodes of the system. So we want to make it realistic and we want to ensure that it will converge to a solution. Therefore, we also add C for friction, uh, for, for damping coefficients and with respect to the velocity of the nodes to the system, we have added uh, stiffness times the delta, which is like the, the, the displacement of the nodes and the mass of the nodes and the the derivative of the velocity of the nodes, which is equal to the acceleration of the nodes. So it's basically a way of rewriting this equation for every node of the system. Right? You see the correspondence now, right? So mvi dot is ex exactly this one, cv is exactly this one, and k delta is exactly this one. And this pix is exactly the external force in which case, in this case, it would be equal to the force of gravity, yeah? Okay, <clears throat> the same things that I just explained. P is the external applied force to the node. In this case, could be gravity. In the case of soap bubbles, this will be simply zero because they won't have any external force applied to them. They will take a relaxed shape. Uh, stiffness, Delta, as I said, the displacement C is the damping coefficient, the velocity, and the, the derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration of the nodes. 
So, okay, now let us focus again on what we want to do. What would you say is our goal here? Now? Regardless of how we are going to solve this equation, what is our equation? What is our goal? Eventual goal. Can someone give it a try formulating our goal here? As a hint, we want to do what Gaudi did, right? What does that mean mathematically? And instead of doing it with change, we want to do it with a simulation based on the laws of physics and so on. So what does that entail in terms of our mathematical business with this equation? Remember, it's going to be exactly like what we wanted to do here. We wanted to find out the position as a function of time. Remember? So, what should be our goal here again? If the applied force is zero, then which one's going to be the position? Yeah, so the, the, the first part, a good one, the first part is probably um, not necessary. It will be only necessary to consider the applied force being equal to zero in the case of finding soap bubbles or minimal surfaces. But even if the applied force is not zero, we are going to find out what will be the final positions of the nodes in the system, right? Why is that sufficient? If we have the final positions of the nodes in the system, Remember, there was a diagram in my topology lecture notes about a mesh that I drew like this. And I drew it again like maybe this. And I told you that the geometry of these two meshes are different, but their topology can be identical, right? So this is very, very important. So if we have only the, the, the last or the final or the, the, the position of the nodes throughout time, we know and we remember that it's not going to change the topology of the system. That's why we call it only shape optimization. It's not going to change the topology of the system. So we will keep the same topology for the mesh. Namely, we will keep the same edges and the faces for the mesh. And we can redraw the mesh at every step of the simulation over time. That's what we're going to do, right? So as Christina said, so we're going to find out the positions over time, okay? And so again, we have a similar situation. We are talking about positions or you can call them delta. If you start counting positions from zero, delta will be almost the same as the positions, right? And then we have the derivative of the, uh, of the positions and the second derivatives of the positions. So again, we have that differential equation. This time, however, instead of solving it mathematically, we are going to simulate it computationally. And you see the difference between mathematics and computation. Okay? There's also a way of solving this fully mathematically, but we are not talking about that right now. We're talking about simulating the solution. So how are we going to do this? Okay, so just keep in mind that our goal is to simulate delta x or actually x with respect to time. And we have to somehow use the other information in the equation. This is the whole information content of our problem. And it should be sufficient if we follow the laws of physics to, to solve this equation. We are basically rearranging these equations to, to focus on what we want to find out and the things that we can record about the system. That's the principle of simulation. We are going to give, it a, give the whole system a nudge, calculate the forces in one step, let the system move towards a better or a more relaxed position, record the previous values, and then using those previous values, how can we estimate velocity, for instance? Remember the price of oil at two consecutive moments? If you have the price of oil over two consecutive moments, you basically have an estimation of 
x of time t plus delta t minus x of time t over delta t. What does this mean to you? Is this not a good approximation of the differential of x over differential of t or the so-called velocity over time? Right? That's what we are going to do because here's the good news. This is good for mathematics books and for mathematical ways of solving equations, but we cannot exactly afford to do things with infinitely small things and infinite precision and so on. This concept of limit is something from continuous mathematics. But with computers, we can easily do this. We can record the previous position, we can record the next position, we can subtract them, we can divide them by a certain amount delta t. And if delta t is small enough, this is, a approximation, this is an approximation good enough for this purpose. Yeah, now we are in the business of simulations. Similarly, if you record the velocity of one moment and the velocity of the next moment, you have basically figured out an approximation of acceleration over time. Right? So just by keeping track of what's happening in the system, we can approximate velocity, we can approximate acceleration, and then we can eventually solve this equation. Or actually, instead of solving the equation, find the next solution for the next moment, for the next moment. So we will be in the business of predicting the next move, the next move. That's why I mentioned the example of the price of oil. Yeah? So, so long story short, we are going to uh, use this approximation, as I just said, by um, looking at two half moments, half a moment later, half a moment before, over delta t, this is exactly like v of time t plus delta t minus v of time t, uh, t minus nothing. It's just a slightly better way of doing that, which is called central difference. So we go half a moment before and half a moment after. Then we have an approximation of velocity at that moment in time. Well, by saying approximation, you should not, uh, you should not, um, look at it as something inferior. This is the best thing we can do with computation because computation is always about discrete moments and discrete space and discrete time and everything is discrete. So there is no other way of simulating this unless we do it computationally and mathematically uh, and, and then using the mathematics again, we are into the business of simulations. So, but that's beside the point. So the point here is that this is going to be an approximation good enough for this purpose, given that this delta t is small enough. And then the velocity of a moment itself can also be considered as the average of two consecutive half moments before and after. And by doing this kind of algebraic trick, we can kind of um, rearrange the whole equation in terms of these terms. And long story short, um, if we just record the next, uh, the next, if we manage to find the velocity at the next moment, we have managed to somehow solve this equation. So long story short, again, this is, this is uh, something that you have to read and, and maybe try. Um, by using these algebraic simplifications, we get into this kind of an equation, which relates the velocity of the next moment to things that we can calculate about the system. This is the velocity of the previous moment, which we can have recorded in our simulation. This coefficient b, which only corresponds to the constants of the system. This is the c for the damping coefficient. This is delta t, which is a constant parameter in our simulation. And there's nothing else in a and b, right? And you have the mass of the system. And there's only something here that um, looks a bit strange to you. That is the resultant force, right? But even this part, 
is all exactly determined by the properties of the system. This is the forces applied to the forces in the, in the system, uh, to the nodes in the system. And this is the stiffness basically following the topology of the mesh or the system. All the springs in between the nodes will determine what will be the resultant force on the node. Can you reinterpret this equation somehow? There is velocity, velocity, and something related to the forces here. So this velocity, if I take it here, that will be in the form of the velocity of the next moment minus the velocity of the previous moment. That will be some kind of an acceleration being proportional to some kind of a force. Make sense? Right? So again, this is similar to F equals M A. Yeah? So there's no mumbo jumbo going on here. This is all based on the laws of motion of Newton, right? And then long story short, we can find the velocity of the next moment based on these resultant forces. But the question is, how do we get to those? We can wait for that question and then just assume that if we manage to get to the velocity of the next moment, then we can actually predict the next position of our nodes. And that should solve our problem, right? Regardless how we will get to this R, if we manage to get to this point, we will have the velocity and we can use this velocity, which is the, the slope of the tangent line that will predict the price of oil at the next moment in time. In this case, it will predict the next position of the nodes of our system at the next moment in time. That means we have managed to solve our problem, right? Now let us get to the bottom of this, which is how do we compute these resultant forces? This is the most sophisticated part of this equation. So remember that the forces are exerted by the springs that keep this node together with its neighbors, okay? So along all edges in our system, wherever I is connected to another neighbor, J, we must have one of those springs with respect to each of which we have a stiffness value, right? And if you consider that you have the same stiffness value for all the edges, then the stiffness value disappears, but that amount of force should be equal to K delta X, right? Imagine you have calculated K delta L, not x just with respect to length so this f here is only a scalar value yeah pay attention to this. so k delta l so now we are far away from our neighbor and then we were supposed to be at the maximum distance or the relaxed distance of i don't know one meter somehow that the edge is stretched then the spring should react to that force that's something we can calculate by means of geometric computations, we can calculate what should be this amount of force using the vector lengths. So there's a vector that we can consider as, as representing that edge. That vector has a length. If that length deviates from the relaxed length of the edge, then we will have a force. Clear? Right? So that edge has two ends, and those two ends have two vector or vertex positions, and those vertices, we can subtract them from each other. We get to a vector that will correspond to the edge length and uh, correspond to the edge. The norm of that vector, which is the Euclidean length of that edge, will be the, the, the length of that edge. And we can subtract that length from the relaxed length of that edge. That will give us delta L multiplied by the stiffness coefficient that will give us F along that edge. How do we indicate that edge? I and J. This I and J indicates an edge between the node I and the node J. Correct? So now, here's the part where it gets probably a bit difficult. Remember I told you that so far you can discard all these X coefficients because we are going to project all these values along the three axes of our Cartesian coordinate system. Okay? Here's the moment where those Cartesian axes of the coordinate system come into play. Now we have to 
we have to treat these forces not only as scalar values, but only uh, but but as vector values. So we need their directions, right? But instead of thinking immediately about an arrow, think about the fact that if you want to write down this force as a vector, then we need what? We need components, right? Along x, along y, and along z, right? So how do we find the components of an edge? Imagine this is an edge somewhere in our system, and it has some kind of a position with respect to the three axes of our Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, and z. So we have managed so far to calculate the magnitude of force along this edge using the, the so-called Hooke's law, K delta L, right? Can you, can you agree with that, right? So we have managed to find the magnitude of the force along this edge. Now we want to treat this force as a vector. Then, therefore, we have to find out the, the, the so-called shadow of this vector along these axes, right? Remember from the, the basic trigonometry that I told you about, uh, at the beginning of this course, how do we find these shadows? Anybody? With sinus and cosinus. Exactly. So Christina has been answering all the questions since the beginning of this lecture. Perfect. So cosine of theta should do the job, right? So cosine of theta, how do we calculate cosine of theta? I mean, we are not going to look at it with a protractor and, 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 and play with a, with a scientific calculator, right? We have to have a better way. Do you see the answer here? This is the last a difficult thing that you have to crack to understand what's going on here. Christina, because you have answered all the questions so far, maybe this is the last one you have to answer. Like the distance along the axis, like the, the length. Yeah. So this one, like yeah. this length, which is x sub i minus x sub j. So if this is node i and this is node j, Usually a good notation helps, right? So this will give us this length along this axis, exactly along this axis, right? So we are only looking at the components of these vertex positions along those, uh, the axis that we are concerned about, right? So now we have exactly this length. And then if we have this thing, it will be exactly like the radius in a circle, in a trigonometric circle, right? So that will give us x over r in a sense, or cosine of theta. So that will do the job for projecting this amount onto the x-axis. And this L is the length of this edge, which I called here r, but I could have called it L i and j. This is the length of the edge i and j. So now we have managed to not only compute the magnitude of the force at time t, but also project it to uh, all axes in our Cartesian coordinate system. Therefore, we have the force as a vector, three-dimensional vector. Therefore, we have managed to calculate this resultant force. And this other force, by the way, also is a three-dimensional force, right? In the case of gravity, it would be just a force going down. If there's wind load or something else, that could also easily be a three-dimensional force. Even in the case of gravity, it will look like this. 0, 0, uh, negative 9.81 if every node in the system has one kilogram of math, mass, right? So even if it's only along one direction, the vector remains still a three-dimensional vector, right? Principle. So long story short, we can manage to calculate R. And then this is going to be the first thing we will do because this is the inner, the innermost, uh, the hardest knot to crack. If we crack this knot, then using R, we can 
which is basically an indication of the force, uh, the resultant force applied to every node. We can estimate the velocity having, uh, sorry, we can estimate acceleration. Having acceleration, we can estimate the next velocity and having the next velocity, we can approximate the next position. Remember, we always use derivatives to predict the next thing, right? We use the, 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 the tangent line, the slope of the tangent line or the derivative of the price of oil over time to predict the price of oil in the next moment in time. This is what's happening here. So we have the derivative, which has something to do with the acceleration in the system. This is the force that is causing the acceleration. Then having this force computed, we can have, we can use it as the acceleration and use the acceleration as the derivative of the velocity to to estimate the velocity in the next moment. And velocity itself is the derivative of the position, which we will use to, um, to predict the next position in time. And that means we have solved the problem. Congratulations, we have simulated the system and we have the positions in the system. This is an algorithm basically consisting of these three steps, three major mathematical steps. So we have done our best to make our implementation as simple as possible. I can probably argue that it's probably the simplest out there in the wild because we have done everything even simpler than this one. We have done everything in a more so-called uh, vectorized way. We are only computing with vectors everywhere and we are using NumPy for this simulation and we have um, basically followed this methodology in computing these values, but uh, instead of using for loops, we are calculating everything with um, vectors and matrices and tensors. And that's how we are computing this. So the, the rest of these details, I think you can, you can read for yourself. I'm running out of time anyway. Um, from the lecture notes, and just want you to remember that the, the way that the graph drawing uh, algorithm works is also based on the same principle. Again, you have springs exerting forces to these nodes. We are assuming some mass for the nodes and we are assuming some damping coefficient. And therefore, this is a more advanced version of the force directed graph drawing, which will relax the system as a bunch of bubbles and will draw you something like this. I could have taken a better picture from the last version of the code, but mathematics is more important anyway than these pictures. Anyhow, so you need, these kind of relations and the strengths of the relations. So uh, quite a few of you asked me, how do we implement the strengths of relations coming from our rail charts into the graph drawing problem? This is how you can do it. You have the algorithm now to play with and complement if you want. And yeah, the CSV input of the file has an address in my system. You can change it to, to the data set that I uploaded on the GitHub today. You can use that CSV input as an example input and eventually replace it with your own data, um, with your own rail charts and you can, you can monitor it. That's it. Questions? Thank you.